the thought would be a very fascinating and insightful um, webinar. Uh, over to you, Robert. Fantastic. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, good evening, everybody. So great pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take about half an hour or so to talk about the work we've been doing on exploration robots towards resilient infrastructure. That's robots that can really be out in the city, in the real world, trying to make our infrastructure better and uh, more resilient. Before I start, I always like to start at the end, if you like, and show you a quick teaser of the kind of things we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to play, play a very small video now to show you from bits and bobs we're up to. Yeah, so just a bit of a, a teaser there. There's some of the things we've been up to and doing. You'll obviously have seen lots of custom built robots there. So one of the things we do in particular is we try to solve, solve applied problems by custom built, unique designs, if you like, of robots. So let's think about infrastructure though. So I always say that infrastructure is the most important thing you probably haven't given any thought of today. So infrastructure being all of the things around us physically that makes our day-to-day -day life um, work well. Things like roads, buildings, pipes, power lines, internet, all of these kind of things are things that we need to do our, do our lives, but we just expect to work. We only give them any thought when they don't work. Um, and that's, of course, a problem. So with the robotic side of things, it's thinking, how can we use robots to try to somehow benefit us to maintain this infrastructure? So in this, in this picture here, we've got different types of infrastructure. We've got, of course, a, a house here, so a residential property. Um, roads, um, this is an old sewer on the right hand side here, so quite a large structure, um, quite old. Of course bridges are also very important infrastructure and of course here we've got some kind of power plant or energy station going on here. So uh, very diverse, very much different kinds of challenges. Um, one of the things that I think about is if infrastructure fails, what are the consequences? So for example, if a road starts to fail with cracks. So we're based on the idea. Sorry. If a road starts to fail with cracks, then you have to um, maybe you have to cordon the road off. You end up with vehicles that are stationary. They start to pollute the environment. You've got people delayed. So although, of course, in terms of irritation and that kind of thing, it's obviously very high. In terms of economic impact, societal impact, well-being, health, 
all of these things are really directly impacted by the infrastructure um, around us. So let's think about some of the things we can do to try and do that. So one project we've been trying to do is to use roads to so use drones to repair cracks in the road. People think this is often you know, a crazy idea. How can you use drones to repair cracks? Because drones are, you know, they don't carry much payload. Really, to the only way to repair a road is to dig it up or fill it, fill it in with large amounts of material. But one thing we're trying to do is really use the right amount of material to um, do the right problem. So for example, um, in, in, in the example of pipes underground, you may end up with a pipe, a water pipe with a hairline crack. That hairline crack leaks water, that washes away some of the material underneath the pipe, which then of course cause a bigger hole, a bigger crack, and this cycle goes on. Before you know it, you've got a very large hole underground, water everywhere, um, big problems, major engineering work. But this whole sort of scenario came about by a few grams of material that were somehow dislodged or damaged in that pipe. So that's what we're talking about here. How can we try to repair infrastructure with the really minimal material um, to make the biggest impact? So we're basically one of the ideas for this sound. So on this one here, we're, we're looking at drones. So I mentioned drones a minute ago. So how can we have drones that can fly around and can actually repair infrastructure? So we can carry, of course, um, 3D printing type technology. So we can fly somewhere, we can land, and we can, we can print material, deposit material onto a structure. I mentioned roads, it could easily be for a roof, for a roof patch or other kinds of things. And one of the questions is here, why do you have that kind of precision um, to deposit things? Why don't you just go there and drop a bucket? Well, of course, we want to minimize the amount of material we put down. And we also want to do a kind of, if you like, tailor the material. So with this kind of technology, with 3D printing or other kinds of depositing technology, we can tailor what material we put down. So one of the reasons that often um, patches, if you like, fail, is you've got a mismatch between the material you deposit and the actual material on the ground. So if you're repairing a road and you put in a material with different stiffness, it will fail because it's a mismatch. So being able to customize things is very important. Um, so this one here I've just shown you is printing, it was a demonstration, we're doing 3D printing with plastic. We of course have gone beyond that. We've, we've been able to 3D print asphalt asphalt being the material that you obviously use as part of roads. Um, interestingly, our 3D printed asphalt has better properties than normal asphalt um, because something to do with the printing process and the way that the actual um, material is deposited it becomes stronger and better. Um, there is a challenge though, if you do 3D print material because you're trying to repair cracks, um, it's very hard to get inside the material. So we've gone from kind of the 3D printing as you might do to create a structure, an object, to kind of 3D pouring printing. So we're doing precision pouring effectively. I can show you some of that stuff in the next slide here. So yes, yeah, so we've modified what we're doing here and we, we actually have a system that can effectively precision pour um, sort of asphalt material. So we have a heating system, we have um, a 3D printing element, which of course this bit down here um, the tip of it, like the nose of it, can be moved around to deposit the material in certain locations. And we can precisely control the heat, the flow, all of these kind of things to try to deposit the material to patch the crack such that it's deposited well and fills completely and repairs the crack. So let's show you a video of some of the bits and bobs here. Um, I'll turn this down a little bit down. So yeah, so one thing, of course, when you when you land somewhere with a drone to print and repair, what you don't want to do is you don't want to um, land somewhere and have to keep taking off. So we actually built one of the first, we're well not the first, one of the first drones with tracks on. So it can, it can land, it can, once it lands, it can drive around. This is actually not a trivial problem because you need to carry the tracks, of course, when you're flying, every piece of weight is a big problem. Um, so you need very, very lightweight tracks, but they can carry quite a heavy drone. The overall system is getting towards 20 kilograms. That's just, of course, to align with um, guidance around flying drones and that sort of thing. Um, so it's quite a heavy drone. It, it lands, of course, it's, it's landing on them with some impact force. So to build tracks that can actually work effectively, but be lightweight, was quite a challenge. Um, you can see here a demonstration of that. And here you can see we were carrying, as a demonstration, quite heavy loads. And of course, the tracks are still moving. If you had very weak tracks and you loaded it very heavy, the friction, of course, would increase and therefore the tracks will stop running. So here we're demonstrating we've got enough power, enough torque to be able to move the drone around, um, even though it's got um, weights on it. There's another problem here. Oh, oh, this is, this is, I'm showing here 
in terms of actually depositing. Let's do this first. So here you can see, um, so we're heating the element, we're depositing material, um, and it's flowing out here. So it's different than 3D printing per se. So we can print asphalt, but like I said, that, that comes out much harder, much more, much less fluid. Here we're deliberately making it ooze out such that it can get deep within the crack and it can actually go and obviously try and repair cracks in a very precision kind of way. Okay, and go. One of the problems though is um, how do you actually find cracks as well? So this is something that we had no idea how hard it would be. How do you identify a crack? It sounds simple, um, but it's really hard because of course there's all kinds of features, there are edges, there are marks, there are drawings, there are all kinds of things on, on real material. And to understand what, a, what is a crack and what is not a crack is very difficult. The consequence, of course, of trying to patch an area that is not a crack is a wasted material. And of course, discarding or not actually patching an area where it, um, it needs to be patched, of course, is a, a problem as well. So um, we've been looking at things like putting grids down and trying to identify things. One of our wackier ideas was actually, because one of the things you can do, of course, you can do um, AI data training. So you can try and use images. You've seen this from my May times, I think, where Google, for example, can identify pictures of dogs and the like. You need large data sets that are tagged to do that. And of course, there just aren't large data sets of cracks. But one thing that's quite interesting is that, um, I'll go back a second. One thing that's quite interesting is that there are, um, your eyes, um, of course, have lots of veins and veins effectively are like cracks. And one thing there is a lot of data on is eyes. Of course, when you go to optician, you, you get your eye scanned. Lots of lots of data around eyes. So we did look at doing that, and that kind of partially worked. In the end, we went towards a simpler solution. Um, but yeah, it's quite it's quite a challenge to do that. Um, and you can see here we, we're able to find a crack, and here we are speed up slightly. We are kind of um, following the crack, and we are printing into that material um, and depositing um, asphalt to patch it. Um, this, is, this is done, of course, we're in one position here, but the actual overall scanning and implementation is done fully um, autonomously. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, that, that was just showing you an example of um, us, how, of course, that, how we can um, use printing drones to do things. Like I said before, we can, we can do different kinds of things. We can print onto rooftops, we can print onto other things. So. Anywhere you want to deposit a small amount of material um, is sort of what we're interested in working towards. We were doing this work um, quite heavily until, of course, COVID came about. At that point, we changed a bit what we were doing. I'm going to show you a bit of a, a, a video here of what we're doing slightly differently. The Self-Repairing Cities project is about using robots to repair infrastructure in a city. For example, robots which will go out and fill in a pothole or they might fly up to a bridge, um, or we're even looking at robots to go into the pipe networks and check for leaks in there. Because of the virus outbreak, self repairing Cities has changed direction slightly to address this new challenge. Robots that were autonomously driving around a city, trying to repair roads, trying to repair bridges, are now being retasked to go into transport hubs like airports and city centres and be able to disinfect the spaces to make them safer for people to live and work. Public areas often need to be disinfected. There's a lot of areas which get touched by a lot of people. So we're using the same robots, the same algorithms and coding that we've been doing, just realigning that for cleaning areas rather than repairing them. Overall, the aim of robots is to be able to um, autonomously disinfect public areas without uh, putting more humans into unnecessary uh, risk. It removes people from harm's way. So we've got a couple of ground-based robots that can map an area and then they've got uh, tanks of disinfectant and spraying arms so that they can spray onto door handles or benches basically any hot spots for the spread of the disease. So we're spraying a um, diluted... Yeah, so that gives you an idea there. So we, we're using the same kind of technology we talked about for, um, this, this case it's mobile ground robots, um, to go around. Um, but now the infrastructure is effectively things that we might use to sit on to touch. And we were um, looking at how we can um, use our robots to disinfect it by spraying on material and working with Lee's um, Bradford Airport and also Lee's Centre. 
one thing we found it's actually really hard to to identify um things in, a, in an area i guess it's quite obvious that is i suppose but here's an example here we're trying to do some what we call semantic video this is identifying things around you um so it's not a question of like here's an object avoid it it's a question of what is the object and what does it mean so really a, a deeper understanding of the object here so you can see here we're able to kind of identify different things such as benches cameras and try to understand the environment so using semantic vision to do that um, so from that we're able to um understand things in the environment such as um, benches rails and other things like that um, that we, we could then go and then disinfect and then clean and um, that was that's the idea um, it's actually even if even when you find something to disinfect it's not trivial so if for example if you find a bench and you want to disinfect it you can't just sort of stop where you are okay i found a bench and just shoot straight at it with infectant you need to kind of plan plan a path so you need to get your vehicle, be it a leg robot or a ground robot. You need to plan where the object is, how you drive alongside it, because you want to drive alongside it, so that you can spray as you go along. Um, so it's kind of a whole sort of navigation, clever manoeuvring type process in order to be able to go and disinfect these, these, these systems. So, so the, the main challenge we had here were identifying things, but then I, say, I think also it caught us a bit by surprise how hard it is to actually maneuver around and disinfect them i think if you could just shoot it in one go it would be easy but because you've got to effectively go along the object and clean it um quite a challenge um, and that's that's ongoing we're still working on that thing we actually won, a, won an award for that um which is great um, for our work on that so um hopefully we'll use that in, in different places um and i think the aim of course is not really amongst when people are often around but you can imagine a deep clean of area um, before rush hour, um, late at night, when people aren't around. Um, and what, what's done now is, is, is quite often, you know, kind of a, a very much similar kind of process, but blasting it. You just make sure it's, make sure it's clean, just, just chuck a load of material at it. Very much like the um, idea of the um, self and Cities project with the small amounts of material, where again, we're trying to minimise the amount of disinfectant you might apply, and therefore, of course, protect the environment. It's good for everybody. Let's carry on going. So another project we have um, in a similar kind of idea is this time underground inside pipes. So it's a project called Pipe Bots. It's been going for a while now, for about a year or so. Quite a large um, project across the UK. And we're looking at how can we have robots inside pipes permanently to be able to um, keep them maintained. So we don't want pipes to leak. We want to find defects early and patch them before they become a problem. Um, so there's many challenges here. One challenge is what kind of robot do you put into the pipe? Um, how does it move around the pipes? How does it find faults? Um, of course, the whole business case around is it a good idea? How will it benefit people? Because it's no good having a technology that is, um, is, is good but doesn't have a good economic impact as well. So working right now on these robots, we have different kinds of platforms, mostly small scale, mostly small robots um, that will be in swarms. So swarms being multiple robots, maybe 20 or so at a time. Um, that's good because that means it's, it's less invasive in the pipe. Putting in a very large robot is an issue that in fact it might block things. And if you lose a robot in terms of it stops working, it's a much more serious problem. Whereas of course, if one of these little robots were, were to fail, for example, um, you'd be able to um, pull it out with other robots and then replace it quite quickly. Um, so this is the vision now. We're about two years in. It's a five-year project, so we're not um, at the stage yet of this kind of um, little robots. We've made some progress, though. So I'll show you a little video here of one of our robots. Um, this one, in fact, is is made for made by 3D printing. So the real nice thing about this one is that it's 3D printed parts are in just two pieces. So you'll see here there's multiple legs, lots of joints, different legs, different things, but the 3D printed parts are in two pieces, top and bottom. So all the joints that you'll see here moving are printed together. So they're, they're, they're printed in one go, if you like. Let's play that again. Cool. Um, so the idea is if you wanted to create them underground, for example, you had a, let's go back, come on, what's going on? Um, for example, you had a miniature, um, box underground that made robots you could then say okay we need three more robots 
we can manufacture them underground. They can go out, they can do their thing, um, they can come back. Robots that are getting a bit old will be decommissioned, parts of them be recycled, parts of them be disposed of in the correct way. Um, but you can actually fabricate them, so it can remove that whole thing about um, having to kind of people pick them out, put them back in, all this kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's one of our robots. We've got many of them we're looking towards um, doing um, in the future. Another project we're working on, which is again, it's like a similar kind of idea. This was done for an international competition, in fact, um, but it's very relevant. Is robots that can put out fires, firefighting robots. Um, so this is something I've interested in a long time ago. And um, there's, there's, there's definitely problems with this kind of idea of firefighting robots in the sense that we'll go back, come on, in terms of the business case that um, if you had a robot that firefights, how would you get to the fire very quickly? How would you, what would you do? How would you use it? So my vision really is that these robots are the robots that are doing the self-repairing cities. Their day-to-day -day job is going around, doing repairs, doing things that are maintaining the city. But of course, when a, there's a problem, these are then retask to be able to go and put out fires to um, extinguish things, that kind of thing. So that's where the business case is. I think um, having individual firefighting robots has its, have its, has its place for very specialized scenarios. But mostly by the time you've got the robot to the site, if that was the case, it might be an issue. Whereas I think having robots that are generally around you that are repairing the city, that can be reused, that's good. So in this case here, you know, what we're trying to do, we're trying to look at robots to go away and do some firefighting, like I said before. And this is a video of the things we have, have air robots and ground robots. The idea is that they can collaborate, work together to be able to go and be able to put out fires. Um, either using blankets, other kind of things, spraying things. Um, very, of course, very important in high-rise flats or high-rise buildings where it's difficult to get to by people if, if the entranceway is blocked. Um, we did this, it was an international competition that took place actually last February, just before COVID, um, in the UAE. So that was um, that was nice to be across there and, and really working with the best teams in the world to do this kind of work. Um, you see here one of our drones here. So it's a, it's a specialized drone carrying a payload of um, a spraying device here. The task they have is that they are, there are heats coming out of these um, holes here um, and you just spray water and it collects the water. Um, one of the things we'll see in a few minutes or a few moments is that the heat, the center of the heat spot is not necessarily where you want to shoot the water out because you might have the hottest point, which is actually away from where you want to extinguish the fire. So there's different kinds of things there. So you can't just get a thermal camera, find the hottest point and spray at that particular point. I'll show you a quick video here of um, some of our drones taking off and doing some work. Okay, clear. Take off. So we've got several ones here simultaneously flying at this building and a ground robot as well. Very hard to get them to actually automatically do this. So we think, we think at this point here, some of them are doing it manually, some of them are doing it not manually. And we do have fully autonomous versions. Um, very difficult though, I'd say, to actually get them to shoot into the hole because there's this, this mismatch between the measurement of the heat and the actual way you deposit water. And here we're going inside a building. Um, there's a heat, there's a hot spot inside a fire. We have the ground people doing that and the air ones on the outside of the building. Um, it's going down. Yeah, so, so that's just showing you the robots um, doing things. Let's look at um, some of the stuff, what, what, what they see. So I mentioned before, in terms of sensor modalities, there are different types. There's, of course, a standard image where you can look at things. There's also geometry, so you don't hit the surface, so you measure the physical position of things. And there are also heat spots. So I'll play this sort of video here. You'll see um, the different kinds of things going on here. So you've got um, this, this one here is a, is a depth map looking at the depths of things. We've got one, in, so this is the bottom left depth map. Top right is the one which has got the heat spots. And then we're fusing things together. So in the bottom right, you can see here our estimate of where the heat spot is on the vision all combined together. 
and you see here we're tracking there we're often tracking away from the actual center of that thing there where the flames go to um so that was our biggest challenge in terms of actually trying to overcome that um how, how we do that and the fact we ended up doing with lots of offsets unfortunately we didn't have a magic way of that because it depends which way the wind's blowing all kind of complicated things in terms of where the heat spot is and where the actual thing is but at this point here the drone is flying about a meter away from the structure fully autonomously shooting liquid water at the structure um which is we're quite successful and we didn't hit it at all we never hit the structure which was quite good of course the, the real risk is you make a mistake and you hit the structure in this case of course it's, it's a nice test scenario it's safe it's where you can fail you can fail safely but in the real case you mustn't of course get anywhere close to a building otherwise you'd lose your drone out of the sky Okay, yeah, so that's, um, I guess, a, a quick flavour of the kind of things we're doing here. I will plug um, a couple of um, our um, films. We make, we make films about what we're doing. So one thing I haven't mentioned at all today is our work to explore the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. So there's a film here that talks about us doing that, taking, going to Egypt, deploying robots, trying to find the secrets of the Pyramid in Giza. And the second one here is what I've just shown you a moment ago, which is a video of um, us trying to build robots to go away and solve not just the firefighting challenge, there's also challenges around um, picking up blocks and the like. This one's more of a fly on the wall, so the, the brains and cranes and other ordeals, more of a fly on the wall kind of fun documentary. The, the, the pyramid one is still fun, but it's more, I guess, more, more serious exploration, if you like. So both, both well worth watching anyway, if you'd like to watch them. They're about half an hour each, so little things to watch. Um, and of course, we have a website, so do, do check out the website if you want to as well and see what we're up to and what we're doing on that. Okay, great. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I appreciate your attention and I'll pass back now for any questions we may have. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the... I'll, I'll stop sharing now. Yeah. Thank you, Robert, for that. Um, quite a fascinating um, um, talk. And I see the sun as created some sort of glare now. <laughs> um, no, stop it right, okay. apologies for that. So we've got a couple of couple of questions. Um, uh, I'll take the first one from Amanda Hall. Um, what are your thoughts on having a common command and control operating system for various different autonomous robots? Yes, I think this is one of the barriers we have generally in robotics um, is around modularity. That can be modularity in terms of the software, in terms of the hardware, interoperability of components. We have this, of course, with many of the PCs. We have different boards we can plug in and out and things like that. So I think... Um, it's something that we really need to find a way of having. And um, the fact that we can actually control robots from a central source and they are interoperable, be it some kind of operating system. Of course, there's always commercial issues around that and people wanting to have their own operating system. And actually many of the systems we have are locked down deliberately in terms of the way you access them and the way you use them because the manufacturers want to avoid that. So it's tricky. How do we come to a sensible business case. Again, it's got to benefit the company, got to benefit everybody else. The fact that these robots can talk and communicate together. But you're absolutely right. Ultimately, the only way to fulfill the vision we have of, of these robots in a city is to having this. We're going to have thousands, hundreds of thousands of different types of robots effectively in the city doing things. They must be able to communicate, interact. We can't have different groups of robots in different ways. It's just not put sensible in any kind of way so yeah i think um we need it as to getting it um i mean it's i guess there's two ways of getting it one way is through collaboration and cooperation so which is the ideal way we somehow have come to an agreement of um standards and the like the other way is a mega company um is able to produce the the, the best robot the ultimate robot that does everything or at least does most things and by then by definition that because that one company owns everything they effectively have the connectivity of course i favor the first the first point but of course we're in constant wrestling with all kinds of things with mega mega corporations and um and technology so i guess we'll see where that goes to in the future and I, and I suppose in terms of horizon for these if you like where we are today in 2021 um and we see what's happening with the autonomous autonomous vehicles Mm. You know, we've got a, a date for electric vehicles being becoming mainstream. Um, what sort of horizon are we looking at in terms of 
when do you think you would see some cities adopt or some of this technology being rolled out in anger? Is it five, 10? What's your feel for in terms of how far away you think this might be? Our vision, actually, we do have a vision for this. It's 2050 for the UK to be fully autonomous infrastructure maintenance. And that, that sounds a long way away. People, people often say to me, that, that's, that's crazy. You know, mobile phones have come on so far in a few years, you know, and you're talking about 30 years time. Um, what's happening there? But I guess to put it in context, we're talking about, as I said before, in a city, like, for example, like Leeds, maybe millions of robots that are interconnected that are functioning, that are around us. It's, it's, it's such a dramatic change to what happens in our lives that I think it really is that kind of time scale. Um, I think in terms of early adoption, we're already there in some senses. I think people already have some robots that do some cleaning, do some other aspects of things. So I think we already have some aspects of it in, in, already going on. But the ultimate vision, I think, is it's is, is, is going to be that kind of time scale. Um, but it's certainly in my lifetime, certainly. And that, that really is quite, quite a frightening prospect. I think we have, to, we have to also wrestle with some issues about what do we want and how do we want things? Because I mean, our, our vision is really that our robots are like urban foxes, such that they are, they're out there in the wild, they're doing things, but you wouldn't really see them. So they'd scuttle away. If you happen to be out at two in the morning, um, you might see one. It would see you at scuttle away. You, you, you wouldn't really hang around. Um, you wouldn't see them um, mostly. Of course, the, the dystopian vision or the vision that's not very good is that you walk outside and the sky is just full of drones that are flying around doing things you don't want. And again, so I think we have to, have to think carefully about how we implement these kind of visions and how we do that. So that, of course, affects timescales and things. But I think regulation in many ways actually is a good thing. It's going to make us do things properly. Um, lack of regulation is going to end up with all kinds of things happening. And I think we end up somewhere we don't necessarily want to be. And for example, you know, I sit, as I sit here to do this talk, I've had 50 drones buzz my house. That's what I don't want. Yes. OK. A question from Maela. How do you manage the risk of cyber hacking? As in the past, telemetry based assets have been subject to attack causing destruct destruction. And I assume the robots are the, are the same risk of cyber terrorism. Absolutely, yeah. So um, we, we've got to be really, really aware of, of that. And of course, um, even though they may be fairly small, they can cause all kinds of havoc potentially if they're in the wrong kind of place. I mean, one thing with the government, I think the UK is probably leading on, which is, which is wonderful, is what we call trustworthy autonomous systems. So trustworthy autonomous systems are systems that are guaranteed to operate in the right way. But that means, of course, they're guaranteed to do things they should do. So if you plan them to move in a certain way, they're going to do that. But as part of that, they're also guaranteed to um, be resilient against things such as um, cyber attacks and things. So they're very, 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 very resilient around how they communicate and how they don't get hacked effectively. So it, it's a real serious thing. But in terms of actually how you do it and then being sure you can do it, that's, that's a big thing. So I think no one's got the answer right now. I think, but we do need to put things in place where mathematically we can. So the, the Trustworthy Autonomous Program is really about mathematically proving that certain things can't happen. So the, the robot cannot physically do something because you because it's coded in such a way that it can never, I don't know what it is, enter a certain region, do a certain thing. There's just no way, it's, 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 the coding is, I say is, is proven absolutely. So right now when we code things, we don't do that. There's no, there's a thing, you can, you can code something, you can run it, run it 10 times, it seems to work. But of course, the way that things are, are generally cracked and hacked is because there are different ways of operating it, different things that have been run. It's been tested, but tested by people just doing things. Whereas the real verification of stuff is when it's mathematically proved that it can't happen in a certain way. And that's what we want to get towards. We're not there yet by any means, but I think the UK is really pushing heavily on this. We invested recently um, 25 million in, in lots of programs across the UK to do to push this forward in different ways. So hopefully we'll get in that direction somewhere. But yeah, well, I agree. We've got to be really careful about that. Um, another question here. How do you plan to protect the robots from issues like vandalism or shutting roads for repair if you send someone to shut the road? I suppose this comes back to your your present you were showing the, the, the robot yeah. effectively, effectively filling the asphalt. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a very good question. So yeah, so um what you'd want to do is so you'd operate when the roads are quiet, they'd have the intelligence to understand, like semantic vision to understand when people are around so they could kind of scarper in, scarper out, if you like. 
Uh, also, other, other robots could, if they need to close a road, um, they could come down. You could have a drone flying down that says, you know, divert left, divert right. We want to avoid that. So what we really want to do is get around, get away from this idea where the road has failed and you have to repair it. It's proactive maintenance such that it never is a condition where it fails. So you're nipping in, you're doing a bit of temporary, a bit, a bit of repair quickly. Um, but if you didn't repair it, it wouldn't fail. So you don't have to do it. So if you are flying across and it's busy, you go, okay, I'll come back next month or do it another time. So it's very much proactive repairing. Um, vandalism is very interesting. Vandalism is a, and a lot of that actually comes down to um, people, obviously people, but people in terms of mindsets, in terms of how they perceive things. That can be socioeconomic in terms of if, if you have robots in areas where people feel that like they haven't got money and this robot's driving around, it's, millions of pounds and it's there and what's it doing there in their area um, so I think we have to do that from a really from a, a people point of view and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reflection of society generally um, opposed to robotics per se um, but yeah it, it's definitely an issue and we have to be very careful how we use robots and how we how, they, 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 they do equal good so I think if a robot's doing good to your community to your area you're not going to not going to demolish it if you feel it's just suddenly appeared and it's benefiting the people down the road loads and it's in your area and it's always passing through to go to a rich area or something, then you're more likely to perhaps vandalise it. So um, it's not the robots themselves, I think, that need protected from it. The robots themselves won't have a self-defence mechanism as such. It's about perception of people and about managing how we use them and how we make sure they should be for everybody. And of course, there is actually, I mentioned before about these large corporations, there is, of course, a concern and rightly so that you know, it becomes the technology of the rich. We don't want that. We want it to benefit everyone. It should benefit everybody. It should not be for those who can afford it, benefit from it. Excellent. Uh, Hazim's got a question. I do have a question regarding the swarm of robots used for firefighting. Where the corporation centralized, or was the corporation centralized or distributed? Also, whether a swarm organization is considered. Yeah, so, so for, I mean, it's a good, good question. So this is a bit of things with swarms. There. Does, so just to clarify what the question is, so a swarm can be multiple robots individually doing things by themselves. So they're kind of collectively doing some tasks, but really they're, they're, they're doing their own, their own thing, but somehow overall they're doing things. Or it can be effectively conducted by, by something or someone saying, okay, you go here, you go there, you do this sort of thing. And this is, these are the two, two paradigms, if you like, of, of swarms. Pure swarms are really not um, centrally operated. They're, they're kind of, they're inherently, they have, they have things that are shared benefits, shared um, things they want to achieve, but they're not centrally coordinated as such. Um, so what, what we've been doing for the, the firefighting one, it was more centrally done in the sense that there was, there was definitely orchestrated, you, know, you go here, you go there. So they were allocating different tasks to different robots and they'd go and do that task. So they have an independent aspect to them, but they are centrally driven to do certain things. Um, in terms of these two different models, um, the if you take away the central, the conductor effectively, um, it becomes much more resilient. So if you were to put in 50, 50 robots into a pipe, for example, um, you really want them to be um, not, not um, conducted, that they have their own their own operations. They work together. That's a true swarm where they're achieving a, gar a target, but they're not reliant on one single robot giving the information because that's that's an issue. There's all kinds of different things about different pros and cons of this. Of course, um, if you, if you're if you're conducting something, you tend to achieve a better goal. So if there's a central robot doing the orchestration, for a better way of putting it, um, the outcome is probably better. Um, but the, thing is, the issue is a breaking down of the communication and, and, and that single robot being, how does it know what's going on? How does it have the information to decide what goes on? How does it pass the information? Yes. Um, so we have to balance these two things and somewhere in the middle, I guess we'll find a common ground. Yes. A very specific question. Do you use robot operating system ROS1 or ROS2? Um, so I think we have both of them. So we have ROS1 for the older robots we're doing right now. ROS2, we're, we're certainly trying to use more get more into it but Ross generally I think one of the early questions was about um, this idea about um, common um, operating systems and the like um, that's been one of the transformative things I think in robotics is it's a Ross operating system that um, it, it means that you can take a robot you can use some algorithms such as path planning 
object recognition yes. uh, and just use it on the back of other people. Going back sort of 20 years, you'd have had to write it all yourself and you have been a new code. So um, I think it's been a really good example of, of how we've moved forward and um, we should definitely try to keep the community. So it's community driven. So people are writing code, uploading them and driving it forward that way. Excellent, sir. Um, has there been any research into using robotics in non-destructive testing to establish the need to repair in advance of failure? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. So I mean, robots, um, I guess you can look at robots as being a way of deploying sensors. So one of the one of the beauties of robots, of course, is that they can get to places that are dangerous or difficult to get to, um, and they can carry sensors. They're doing non-destructive testing. Um, so yes, yeah, so robots combined with these sensors is absolutely being done. In terms of fully autonomous deployed robots that are in the real world, not yet, I don't think. So there are definitely robots where someone's driving it and it's got a sensor on which is non-destructive and you can see things you couldn't see otherwise. That's definitely happening. In terms of a robot that's just gone away, done something non-destructive and come back and told you about it, that's not happened yet. So that's, that's the next challenge is to really make these things um, not reliant on humans to do this testing. And that's not that humans, um, are doing a badger by any means, um, but they you just can't do enough of it. So if you want to if you want to test things, you want to really investigate proactively. So right now we're just doing tests where we think there's problems primarily. Well, where we where we fear there's problems anyway. Um, but if you can do more testing, you can find things quicker, you can repair them faster, it's better for the environment and so forth. So yeah, so robots to do non-destructive testing is a big thing. I think it will definitely come on soon. Another question from Amanda Hall. Um how do you manage the ability to navigate large distances while still having millimeters of precision to take action when the robot arrives at the fault that needs fixing? It's about yeah. How you so so yeah. So so um, I mean, there's a whole thing about robots at the moment. Robots traveling what you call beyond line of sight. Um, that's an issue generally. So be it drones, be it ground vehicles. At the moment, things can't do that. So I could I couldn't send a vehicle right now between locations. Of course, autonomous cars are an example of which is getting quite close to that. So of course, autonomous cars may travel between large distances, but robots generally, they have to be in what they call line of sight. Um, but in terms of the technology of um, these things, um, they must have the, if you like, autonomous action. So they must do the measurement of their local surroundings and work out what the task is there. So you wouldn't, it wouldn't be down to you to work out a particular coordinate so you wouldn't be saying this this gps coordinate down to the millimeter deposit the material here you'd be saying go to this location fix the fault it would get to the location it would use its vision much like we did with the um with the bench example um for the spraying it would then use its own vision to work out what's around it what are the objects how far are they away local scanning which could then could be millimeter or sub millimeter precision and then you could act upon and repair that task or do, do that task. So, so yeah, so large, getting between place and place or between locations is definitely large scale GPS motions um, with some local avoidance. Um, but when you get there, the robot then relies purely on local information to do its task. And the question here, do you anticipate drones and their payloads to grow in size and weight as bat battery technology improves, allowing for greater energy density? And what opportunities do drones and the much bigger payloads offer for infrastructure maintenance? So I think definitely um, we're going to see um, larger drones um, we're with battery powers. Of course, regulations are already allowing us to do more. So once the regulations are relaxing, but they're changing such that um, larger payloads are becoming more possible. Um, the evidence, the evidence base required for larger payloads is less and that'll carry on going. And, and, and for sure that even the last five years or so, um, the actual endurance of drones has gone up dramatically. So, you know, from 20 minutes to 30 minutes to 40 minutes. So we're already seeing that coming through right now. We can, we can carry out leftier things. Um, I think in the, in, the, in the short or medium term, the impact of this energy um, advantage is that we can start doing things to structure. So right now drones are observational, mostly. So they're flying around, they're doing amazing stuff with, with sensors that are non-contact flying around. We'll see um, much more things being picked up, placed, moved, positioned. That could be logistics, of course, carrying parcels around. That's going to come. We all know about that. Um, it could be attaching to a, to a structure, drilling a hole. It could be um, pushing things around. Um, so we we'll see a lot more of that kind of, that kind of thing in the future. I think it's, it's the next level. So much is really probably 
15 years ago, we didn't really think much about drones. Um, you know, the drones existed. This is, this is rotary drones I'm talking about here, of course, the ones we see um, with like multiple propellers on. Um, we, we saw them about, we didn't, it wasn't really transformative. There were interesting quirks, they were flying around, they were in research labs. Um, but now, of course, so they're, they're really often everywhere. We'll, we'll go for walks in the countryside and we'll, we'll see them around, so they're very commonplace. And that, that transformation is going to carry on. So 10 years from now, we're going to see drones doing much more physical tasks. They'll be flying down, they'll be landing, they'll be grabbing things, pushing things. Um, so for example, the bridge case, they could be spraying bridges, they could be drilling holes in bridges, depositing material. Um, all of that kind of thing is going to happen um, in, in, in the medium or short term, I think. Not long term, I think it's very, very soon. As for super drones, um, you can imagine lovely large scale drones. Of course, we've all seen about people being carried around them. So in terms of passenger vehicles, that's something that probably is going to come. Um, I'm, I'm not so clear about how that's going to happen or how that's going to actually um, be benefit us. Of course, the risks here, we've got the sky again full of these large drones that are carrying things around. Um, but beyond beyond the scale of carrying people, I would be, I would, I wouldn't expect we'd see larger vehicles than that. Because I think we just, well, we just don't want that. I mean, you can imagine, of course, right now we have shipping crates. Do you want shipping crates flying through the sky with twenty drones carrying them? It certainly could happen in the, in the in the medium long term. But I think we're going to be quite reluctant towards that. And I think in that case, we're going to be looking towards more underground things, um, high pollute boring technologies, whatever it might be. I think we're going to want them out of sight and not in our skyline. And a, a very good um, question from Tony. To achieve your 2050 vision, what key technology breakthroughs or improvements are on your wish list? Oh, yeah. Um, so definitely regulation um, is one of them, um, beyond line of sight regulation. And the technology to achieve that. So I think that the burden on regulation is definitely with developers. And we have to be able to prove understand and prove our technology such that we can predict not just will it fail won't it fail but the the amount of time before it fails and i think we're not quite there yet with drones we are with cars we understand quite well with cars but for a drone for example i build a drone um how can i say that how many flight hours it will be how many millions of flight hours it will be before it fails um so that's kind of it's kind of technology i guess it's technology related it's understanding technology uh, but we need to have that to, to be out of regulations um we, of course, need to have better batteries. Batteries is one of the big issues of, of, of this, as we said before. If we can 10 times our battery power, um, we, we, you know, we really transform what we're doing um, to make that happen. So um, definitely batteries are in there. Um, I think we, we, we've already got quite good technology around um, algorithms for vision and operation. Um, but definitely faster computing would be, would be an important thing, um, being able to do that. As I mentioned before, the connectivity. I think that's, that's a really good point, and I think that's, that's definitely a, a big thing and not easy to solve. So a lot of these things with a vision to solve are not like when you need a faster motor or a better, better composite material. Well, of course, these all help. It's a lot of the, the really sticky things that go the interface between people, between regulations, between business, between the environment. Um, and that's going to take some time to go through. Um, and we, what we need to do really is to have um, one of the councils be really innovative and take the, take the initiative on board and try and push it forward and have that kind of, uh, kind of um, work with them to try and get an example that works. And then once it works, you have like a tipping point, you show it working, it becomes too good not to do, and then it really gets spread out. Um, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the short, medium term, definitely batteries, like I say, and regulations is, is a big thing. Excellent. And I suppose in terms of... Um career choices i mean this is an exciting area and you've got a 20 2050 vision so are there any particular areas you'd like to see or the people on this uh, on this webinar who'd be thinking this might this looks really really exciting how to, how to get involved uh, what what would you suggest as a the pathway to get involved in this quite a quite quite promising area so i think there's different ways um so one way of course is through education um, and this can be through um, degree courses such as uh, mechatronics, robotics, computer science, electronics, social science. And I think that it leads we collaborate across all of the universities, um, collaborate across crazy amounts of disciplines. I think it's so connected these days with all the things that are going on. We need all these different areas. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's only degree courses to really get understand what's going on and be able to contribute that way. 
Um, but there are other routes. I think, of course, um, as a hobbyist, um, there are things out there that are pretty cool you can do and you can get involved and you can learn a lot yourself from building and doing, um, which is, I think, because many of these sort of computer software things right now and things like ROS, for example, are really accessible. So you, as a non-expert, if you are a non-expert, um, could go away and you could program things and you could use parts of ROS um, to do things like vision analysis, other things and, and mapping um, relatively straightforwardly. So that's, that's another issue, another, another opportunity. I think, I think personally why, well, no, I think there's, there's obviously there's different ways of doing it. So definitely education, but one opportunity that's very good is entrepreneurship right now. I think that the, the world in the UK is just completely open for innovation in this space. And it's the time's right. I think um, th there's going to be massive transformation now. Um, lots of, lots of space for really good innovative companies to come through. Um, so people with, with a background already, a technical background, um, that's a really good opportunity, I think, to start doing technology. Uh, it needs to be good technology, robust, applied to the right problems. We don't want, well, no, there's no space for technology that doesn't solve problems. But if you can find a, a good solution to a good problem with robotics, I think you're in a good place to really start business.